I think in all of our culture's histories, we can find strong women who have been leaders, who challenge the idea of the model minority myth. Hey everybody, welcome to Identity Unveiled. We are a lifestyle platform that talks about career, beauty, health, and to help support the advancement of Asian American women to the executive ranks. Today, we're gonna to focus on a topic that as Asians, we experience whether knowingly or not, the model minority myth. Now, as an advocate for mental health, I'm excited to be talking about this topic and the impact that it has on our identity at work, at home, and, and about ourselves. Dr. Sally Chung is a licensed clinical psychologist that specializes on exploring how your cultural identity and past relational experiences impact your ability to connect meaningfully with others. Welcome, Dr. Chung. Hi, it's great to be here. Now, Dr. Chung, this is a really deep topic. In fact, you know, I'd venture to guess that there are maybe Asian women out there that don't even know that this myth even exists or even the subconscious impacts it can have on our performance in the workplace. And, and honestly, how we engage with others and ourselves in our daily lives. How do you define the model minority myth? I mean, I think that's a great question. I think lots of people approach it from different ways. I see the model minority myth as this stereotype right, or this myth that presumes that Asians, Asian Americans are highly successful and like very high achieving in contrast to other minority groups. So we have that model minority, right? So we are placed in comparison to African Americans, Hispanics, Americans, Indigenous Americans, as we're held up as, oh, look, they made it. So there's no, no reason y'all, the rest of y'all don't make it. It's often used as a wedge between minorities, right? Because we're held up as the population who can pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and make it in this hostile country. Why can't these other groups make it? I believe this model minority myth, if my research and my memory serves correctly, came about around the time they were um, dismantling the Chinese Exclusion Act. Because before that, like, you know, all Asians were banned from um, immigrating to the country and they, they looped in a whole bunch of other groups and people under that act. But it was about like uh, yellow terror and how Asian folks were dangerous and will steal your jobs and steal your women. And so because the U.S. wanted business ties with China, right, they wanted to open up trade, they had to rebrand us, rebrand us into something that wasn't threatening, that was um, acceptable to the general uh, American sensibility because we've been painted as villains um, and prostitutes this whole time. And so they repackage us to be, oh, they're smart, they're hardworking, they keep their head down, they don't ruffle any feathers, they don't make waves, so that we're acceptable. How do you address the model minority myth in the workplace? Yeah, no, I think the model minority myth <clears throat> is kind of a double-edged sword. A lot of folks will say, you know, there's something nice about like showing up to a place and people expecting you to do well, or they they know that you'll do well because you're Chinese, Japanese, Korean, Indian, you're Asian. But it also holds us up to this weird standard where we're high achieving, but we're also presumed to be like really passive, the quiet person in the room. We do well, but we don't really speak up. It makes it hard to move from to move into like management and leadership positions. Like we don't see a ton of Asian CEOs in, com in companies they haven't started themselves, right? It's hard to hit, it's hard to break the ceiling to get to the C-suite. It's hard to be um, upper level leadership because when you think about the model minority myth, we are, you know, we're passive, we're quiet, we're soft-spoken, we are easygoing. Those are great like team player characteristics, right? We get along with everyone, which is why we're not threatening and we're great coworkers. But those are not traits that people look for for leaders, right? We want our leaders to be assertive and, and loud um, and have vision. And oftentimes those, well, not often, that doesn't fit with this model minority myth. Could there be an aspect to the myth that actually serves us well? Yes. It gives us this almost automatic positive light. Like people look at us and they go, oh, they're Asian. They must be smart. They must be good at this. They're going to be easy to get along with. Um, they're good at STEM, math, and sciences, which if you're not, really kind of screws you over. So I think being able to be seen positively is something that folks um, enjoy as a part of being sheltered under this myth. But that's also short-lived, right? If we are high-achieving 
and we um, can naturally do well because Asians are naturally smart, naturally high achieving, then it justifies pulling support from us, right? We see groups voting to end affirmative action to the point where you have even, you know, Asian subgroups fighting for that as well. Like, you know, one of the heartbroken to say that so many, you know, Chinese, Chinese Americans have supported the taking away affirmative action, not realizing that affirmative action is one of the reasons that we've been able to be successful. We've been able to enter these spaces that have been traditionally barred to us. And so like, it's nice to have this veneer of almost respectability in a way. They're smart, they're high achieving, they're great to hang out with, they're great to work with, but it's also really limiting. That's an interesting point you bring up. I hadn't thought of it that way. Well, I think this speaks to the impacts, um, if you haven't spoken about yet, on how does this impact women and leaders as we show up? Yeah, I think it makes it harder for folks to get promoted into those spaces, right? If you, if people look at you and they're like, model minority myth, she's smart and she's talented, but you know, she's not much of a leader. She doesn't speak up very often. Or, you know, she, she takes really great notes, right? Mm -hmm. But I'm not really seeing her heading this team, right? So the traits they look for in leaders aren't the traits that they attribute to the model minority myth. We all know that women in the workplace, just women in general, if they are more assertive, if they demonstrate those more traditionally leadership uh, traits, we're labeled as bitchy, demanding, right? Hostile even, bossy. But you put those same traits on a dude, and it's, oh, he's got leadership. He's so assertive. He knows he knows what he wants, right? And so for Asian women, Asian American women, there's so much more of that is, is ascribed to us. If women as a whole, if a white woman isn't really allowed to speak up or is, is seen as um, not leadership material for these reasons, how much more us, if they expect us to be that much more compliant, that much more subservient, that much more soft-spoken. <clears throat> and then even outside of the model minority myth, as you had mentioned, there are other stereotypes that impact Asian women. We have this history, you know, being seen as China dolls, right? Mail order brides from Korea or Japan. Um, we have decades of, of entertainment and, and plays and theater about us. Um, and then we also have like the dragon lady. And, and one of the big examples is uh, Lucy Liu in Charlie's Angels, where she's a super kick ass, right? Mm -hmm. Where if you go from super quiet and subservient or like super aggressive um, dragon lady, highly sexual, highly provocative, or even like the tiger mom, right? Really demanding, pushes her kids to succeed. But none of these stereotypes are seen as leadership potential, right? You're either way not enough or way too much and people don't need to pay attention to you because you're just over the top. So I think it can be hard to be heard in the workplace when you're trying to find that balance. That is so true and resonates about, you know, having your own voice what are your thoughts or what are your suggestions for women on how to manage that myth and the impacts it has on their career? I think that's a complicated question because the question implies that we have control over how others perceive us mm -hmm. and how other people will interpret our behavior and our um, successes in the workplace. So unfortunately, we can't do that. I think though being aware of that environment that we're, the culture of our company, the people that we're reporting to is important. How do my teammates look at Asian women, right? We, we live in a time where a lot of us work in very diverse workplaces, right? There's, there's more openings. People are immigrating and moving all over the place for these jobs, but everyone still comes in with their stereotypes. Even Asian guys come in with their stereotypes, right? So being aware of, how do these people on my team see me? Because that's going to impact how you interact with them. Not necessarily because you're going to be catering to it, but kind of keeping in mind that's the filter that they're seeing your actions and your interactions with them through. We can only really focus on our own behavior, on our own growth. So I think if you, I really, I always strongly encourage people to find a mentor. And I know that can be a little bit double-edged because there are certainly folks who have worked their way up the ladder and um, for some reason have chosen to pull the ladder up after them or shut the door behind them. But for the most part, I think there is a, there's so much value in finding connection and communication and mentorship and camaraderie with other Asian women in the workplace or in your industry so that you can feel less alone in your experiences. Um, you can both hear how people who've been in the field longer have navigated these issues 
and how they've done it. And you you can also help other folks who are newer in the field and maybe encountering um, things you've already encountered before and they're not sure how to manage it. Shifting a little bit to cultural identity, because I know that's your, your area of expertise. So tell us a little bit about, you know, how do you uh, work with people on, on managing their cultural identity? I believe cultural identity is something that changes over the lifetime as we encounter different experiences, as we hit different milestones in our lives. It is a combination of all these different groups to, to which we belong. Generally, when people talk about cultural identity, they're talking about like ethnic and race um, identity. So um, being Asian and being American, right? Growing up here, but having ethnic background that is not white American or European American, Caucasian. <clears throat> so we look at kind of that experience. A lot of the folks I work with also have immigration as a layer on top of that. Because the experience of immigration is, is inherently traumatic, right? Your family, whether you're making that decision or you're making the decision for your family, you're uprooting it from uh, a place that you're familiar with, that you grew up with, where your family, friends, community, language, customs are, and you're moving to a place where it's really uncertain. You don't know what that future is going to hold. Even if you're moving for a really good reason, it's still traumatic. Any kind of move is traumatic. Moving to a different city when you're five is traumatic. Mm. Imagine your whole family moving to a whole different country and everything is just upside down. And so when you layer that on top of cultural identity, it's really interesting because the folks who work, uh, the folks I work with, cultural identity, who have either grown up here, were born, grown up here as second gen folks, or who grew up, who moved here when they were little, their <clears throat> identity work, their identity is different than um, the Asian, Asian Americans who came over later um, when they were in their teens or for college or post, right? The older we get in that time of moving, immigrating, the more um, set our identity is gonna be in that in our that homeland. So like my parents, even though they have lived in the US way more years than they lived in China, for them, they're gonna be Chinese, Chinese period till the day they die, right? That is where their identity was shaped and formed for the first 20 odd years of their lives, right? That's where our their brains were completely developed. That's the customs, the traditions, all of those things were soaked into them, taught to them in that space. I do remember when my de parents are Indian and when they came over and, well, when they were applying for citizenship, either mm -hmm. American citizenship or Indian, for the American uh, citizenship, <clears throat> one of the questions is, will you take arms against your home country? Mm -hmm. It's a tough question. I mean, of course they said yes, you know, but yeah. it's a hard question. It is a really hard question. And that, that reminds me of like back in World War II when they were interning all the Japanese, Japanese Americans, right? And and I don't know if you ever had to read the book No No Boy in school. I didn't read it until college in an Asian American studies class. Um, but this this author wrote this whole book about um, Japanese men who were given the opportunity to fight in World War II, and they had um, to swear allegiance to the U.S. Right? Do you you know swear to forsake all ties to Japan? Would you take up arms and, you know, like all these things, right? So it's no, no. The answers had to be no and no um, mm. for them to even be able to, to join the military, to fight for their home because the country was so suspicious of their allegiance. And so I think cultural identity is complicated by immigration, by our family's experiences. So if your family had a relatively comfortable immigration transition, say like they had money, you already had family here. So it wasn't like we came here, we had nothing. Um, and you had a lot of a buffer around, this is our community, this is our culture, this is our all these things that we can buffer the, the ethnic heritage that you have. That's gonna be a very different experience than families who move over or refugees who come over with little, who don't know the language, don't have connections. And they're just trying to find any kind of job to put food on the table and leaving their kids to kind of figure things out on their own as they can. So sometimes, all the time, a lot of cultural identity work is untangling that. Um, who am I? My connection to my to these groups that I belong to or supposedly belong to, and then untangle that from my own family experiences of what this culture is like or has been. So kind of closing up here with our, our last question, 
For women in particular, here at IU, we really like to emphasize that our emphasize that our culture is a strength. So how can one learn to embrace their cultural identity as a source that strengthens them as a leader? And I know we're talking about the model minority men. Mm -hmm. And and yes, that has negative implications as a whole to all people of color. But for us, you know, and our, our Chinese, our Vietnamese, our Korean, our Indian culture, you know, how do we embrace those aspects of us as a, as and to be, you know, as a, as a strength rather than as something to put behind us? Yeah, no, I think that's a really important thing because we can't just put it behind us. Um, when I was in graduate school, one of the things they teach new therapists is leave yourself at the door, right? It's all about the client. Um, and to an extent, that's true, right? You're not going to be talking about yourself in session um, with your client. However, if you're a, a person of color, a woman of color, Asian American, you can't leave yourself at the door. You inherently show up the way you show up because of the way you look. Um, and that's how kind of I, how I got into this work. That's how I specialized in this because people started seeking me out. Asian, Asian Americans started looking for an Asian therapist because, wow, there was such a thing. And so I think part of being able to embrace who we are is knowing who we are. And I think that's why understanding where we see our cultural identity, where we are, is so important because then we can recognize that the values we have and we embody and we strive to live, we can see where they're rooted and how we want them to be seen. I encourage folks to do a lot of like intentional exploration of their culture if they haven't had a lot of exposure to it. If you grow up here, you know, you we get all the holidays in school, we're taught all these things, we we soak in all this passive information just by simply living in a place. Mm. And if you come from a family that doesn't have that pool for you to soak in when you're not in school or out with your friends, then you lack a lot of information, right? I've had folks say, I don't know anything about my cultural holidays. I don't know the language. My parents didn't care about any of that. They know all of it, but they never transmitted it to us. And some of it, it's because maybe it wasn't transmitted to them or they were used to having just passively soaking in this information that they didn't think that they would have to actually tell us and teach us these things. And so if you're interested in that part of your ethnic heritage, I would encourage folks to explore that. I think in all of our culture's histories, we can find strong women who have been leaders, who challenge the idea of the model minority myth. I also wonder if the model minority myth is exclusive to here, to America, or to just like Western society, because I don't know that it's that it shows up in Asia, hmm. right? There are definitely gendered stereotypes in Asia, but no one expects everyone to be good at science or math, right? No one expects women to just not say anything. That's a good point. I'd, I'd have to ask my my cousins in India um, <laughs> whether or not they've experienced that 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 stereotype of being good in math and and science. It's a good yeah. point. Yeah, yeah. So I think being able to engage and and look for things that um, resonate with who you are in this time of life. How what does it look like to be a leader for yourself? You can still embody those experiences and those traits while being aware of this is how other people see me right? You might be underestimated. You might be overlooked. It doesn't mean that you don't keep doing what you're doing. I do think also there's just, there's parts of that stereotype. Maybe we, you know, are quiet. Maybe we are um, more introverted, but there's strength in that as a leader, especially now as we're moving towards more emotional intelligence facets being important to leadership areas of empathy, areas of, um, you know, being assertive, but not aggressive. Mm -hmm. I think there are, there are, there's facets of who we are as in our Asian culture and our Asian identities, um, however you define that, that are absolute strengths that can be leveraged as. Absolutely. I mean, I think so many Asian cultures have this um, value of like collectivism, like the doing something that's good for the whole, good for the, the greater good type of thing, right? Harmony. I think that's an excellent thing to embody as a leader for teamwork cohesion, right? A lot of folk, a lot of companies spend so much time and money, money trying to promote team cohesion and team connection because if your team can get along and work well with each other, then you're going to, your business is going to do better. 
And I think Asian women have a lot to bring to that table about helping people work through conflicts, helping people understand each other, um, working through complicated uh, social dynamics. As women, and especially as Asian women, we know how to navigate that because we ha we've had to do that all our lives. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Chung. Uh, on your expertise and model minority myth, we really enjoyed today's conversation. To learn more about Dr. Chung, please follow her on Instagram. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was wonderful talking to you.